In this last lecture, we look at some topics in computer science. Computer science deals with the mathematics of algorithms and data structures. Many mathematicians also use computers to do experiments. The subject is also important in artificial intelligence. Let's see what first what e experimental mathematics is. It's become a subject by itself. Many books have been devoted to it. Let's make a first experiment. <clears throat> look at the first digits of the powers of 2. You see here the first 2, 4, 8, 1, 3, 6, 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, etc. Here are more. A small computer program allows to make statistics. We see that the number 1 appears more frequently than the number 2 or 3. The picture does not change much when taking larger numbers. Indeed, the distribution converges to what one calls now the Benford distribution. Maybe uh, it also should be called the New Comp ben Benford Law as it has been discovered also uh, earlier in 1881 by some Newcomb Howard graduate. <clears throat> How general is that law? For example, what happens if you replace powers of 2 by squares numbers? So here we see the experiment. Uh, we also did some experiments in class with primes. Uh, can we explain this strange behavior? Obviously, there is no Benford law for primes. Uh, but the law comes back if we take powers of primes. What happens so it seems to be important that when we look at sequences, then we have them grow faster than linearly. Otherwise, we get into uncharted territory. But in any case, also here with prime powers, we get into a branch of ergodic theory, a branch of dynamical system. Here's another riddle. Why does the Western music have the 12 tone chromatic scale? What happens is that the Pythagorean scale is close to a tempered scale. So this, that's the Ophantine problem. <clears throat> One can explain this using a notion pushed forward by Euler. He assigned to a rational number A over B a number called gradus suavitatis, a degree of sweetness. So first reduce the fraction A over B, then look at the, all the prime numbers which appear in A times B. Take the sum as indicated here, like with uh, a is equal to 5 and b is equal to 12. a times b is 60 and has the prime factorization 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. So it's 2 times 2 minus 1 plus 1 times 3 minus 1 plus 1 times 5 minus 1, which is 9. You see also a little program which uh, has been used here to compute the gradus suavitatis for fractions a over b in some square. <clears throat> One can now attach a sweetness value to a real number by summing up the sweetness values of rational numbers nearby and then look at the sum of the sweetness values over all nth roots of 2 to the k. For n equal to 12 this is quite good. Here's another experiment for which the mathematics is very much in the dark. It's part of random matrix theory but the matrix entries are not independent. They First example is a snowflake, snowflake matrices where the, we take the cosine nma plus mb where a and b are constants. And the second are the GCD matrices where we just take the GCD of n and m to the power s where s is a complex number. So here is an animation of this snowflake matrices. You can watch it on, a, mit, uh, on video, a video on Vimeo. And uh, here's a picture of a GCD spectrum featuring a spiral pattern. The next experiment deals with primes. There's a separate slideshow about this. don't want to repeat uh, much, but the riddle deals with Gaussian primes, primes in the complex plane. And uh, so here see the small ones. The question is to understand the ratio of the number of primes on the real axis, positive real axis, and the primes just above it when the imaginary part is 1. So uh, Hardy and Littlewood have made uh, predictions. And the structure of Gaussian primes is well understood in some uh, domains, but we don't know, for example, whether there are infinitely many primes just above the, the real axis. So here is the result uh, of an experiment, or well, data for an experiment I have been running since May 2016. It measures the ratio of primes on the real axis and the row above. Uh, Hardy and Littlewood have predicted a pre precise number, constant c, for the limit. But we have no idea whether this is true. But we can investigate it experimentally. And this is the end of part A. I hope it gave you a f an idea 
mathematicians can work on unsolved problems with a computer without expensive equipment. Let's look at the, a little bit at the history of computing. My choice is shaped by personal taste, especially in the later part where we look at some computers which have been dear to me. The earliest computing devices, device is the Abacus. It could have been used already by the Sumerian or Persian mathematicians, but the first serious archaeological evidence is 200 BC uh, when the Chinese Abacus appeared. Also, the Romans had abaci, and here is a Chinese abacus used a few hundred years ago, as they are sold still today. The Japanese abacus has a little bit of different structure. The Incas also had a abacus type device in which grain was used to do the computations. The principle of computation is, however, unclear, and there were various theories about it. Around 1500, algebra started to pick up steam. Computations done on paper and with pencil, paper and pen became a competition to Abaki, as illustrated on this picture. An interesting device is the Antikythera. We know uh, that it has been a sophisticated analog computer for astronomy. It could have been designed by Archimedes. The mystery has been more, more and more cleared up ago, thanks to a, a mechanism of fabulous ingenuity techniques. was created and in Greece. Are, uh, a machine a capable of indicating this. exactly uh, how the sky would look for decades. <clears throat> a proper analog computers, the South Pointing Chariot, can be seen as an early analog integration device as it adds up the changes of orientation to get always the right direction. Uh, another analog computer is the Astral Lab. Uh, it has been used uh, to compute the latitude on Earth. It's a close-up of such a device. Uh, there are nice explanations online explaining how the device works. The planimeter is another uh, analog computer. It allows to compute the area. It was invented in the early 19th century by a Bavarian uh, engineer. It is based on the integral theorem of Green, uh, found later. The slide rule is also related to mathematics as it uses the concept of logarithms which have been invented by Joost Burgi and John Napier. It allows to multiply numbers. There are also circular versions. I had built a circular one myself in high school as we had to, to do races in the math classes. You can buy now even get, uh, watches which for entertainment or a coolness factor contain a slide rule. Computer history starts with a Schickert computer. William Schickert built in 1623 the first automatic calculator. Also Pascal built a mechanical calculator. He was 19 years old, he, but he built 15, 50 prototypes until it really worked. Also I, Leibniz built a computer in 1672. The first machine was based on binary system. Charles Babbage built the first general purpose programming programmable computer. Uh, it is located uh, at, the, at, at the Museum of uh, London. Here's a YouTube video showing how the machine worked. So uh, the re this is a re uh, rebuilt machine. It was hand-powered. Ada Lovelace is considered the first computer programmer. She worked with Charles Babbage. In Germany, during the war, Konrad Zuse built several computers. Z1 was the first freely programmable computer and Z3 the first Turing complete computer. In the US, the first elec electric programmable computer was Mark I. You see them in the basement of the Science Center. Grace Hopper was one of the first computer programmers on the Mark I. She was also the first female rear admiral in the US. Amazing Grace. Colossus was the first electronic digital programmable computer. And yet the first electronic programmable Turing complete computer was used for uh, building atom bombs. And in 1947, after the war, the transistor came. Around the same time, uh, also mechanical calculators were miniaturized. This is a quarter gear type calculator. But then uh, the ele electronic and electric and electronic computers took over. Michelle Feynman, the daughter of Richard Feynman, tells here about uh, how My human was computers were a, a used in the computers. Manhattan Project. It was Actually, a transition, mainly... of course. Uh, also, the recent movie Hidden Figures illustrated mathematicians were doing computations by uh, hand, but then the computers were taking uh, over uh, also at uh, NASA. The first electronic calculator saw the light in 1967. Uh, since then, they exist in the classroom. There had been a competition, especially between HP and TI, when I was uh, as in school. I myself had a TI-57, which is shown here. 
I also had a TI-59. I even built and added two interfaces, a joystick and an electric, electric switch. They were just soldered in, they went into the guts of the, of the calculator. The Altair 8800 is probably the first uh, PC. Then scientific computer was making progress. It's a gray computer introduced in 1976. Yeah, big monsters. Cray 2 in 85 had already 1.6 gigaflops, which is about the same than an iPhone 4 from 2010. Personal computing started to, to take off with computers like the Apple, Apple here says the Apple 1, Apple 2, and, and of course the PCs. I myself got uh, one of these TRS clones. You see a picture of me in high school with such a computer. I also got an Atari computer that had, been, had only floppies. Later, I uh, had a hard drive for which it had about 20 megabytes, but it played already cool games and I uh, programmed MIDI uh, uh, stuff with it. Later, also got the next uh, computer. This was a really nice machine. Nice time followed. So, here on, in Texas, you see uh, our living room was a computer laboratory, and I had PCs. I had a Sun, the next Max. Um, it's a picture. Of an iMac I used in 2002. This is in here at Harvard and Science Center. And uh, evolution of the Macs is tracked by Mac fans all over the world. Entire libraries fit now in a small i on a small iPad. It was a great moment for me. And currently computers are so tiny and light they can be ca be carried anywhere. And then came the phones, and also that evolution has uh, continued. And watches will soon be as powerful as our laptops. Uh, here's a page uh, from a, a book which uh, includes a little bit about the history of computing. And this is the end of the exhibit on computers. The technology in the classroom changed also in an interesting way during the last decades. Not only uh, the computers, it's also the, the pedagogy. How much technology do we really need? What is healthy? And uh, I made this slide here 10 years ago. Uh, about kind of certain developments, but it uh, much more has been added since. For example, 3D printing, Wolfram Alpha, YouTube, etc. Uh, also, apps have appeared for the phone. Here's a photo math, which allows students to solve math problems uh, on the phone. It gives you even the intermediate, not only the answers, but it also gives you the intermediate uh, steps. As a teacher, one has to know that this is, uh, this is possible. And uh, so we live in an exciting time. But still, much more is to, to come. So what is, what is the future? Uh, in the movie, The Thinning, the future is displayed uh, uh, so, uh, in, a, in a way so the contact, there are contact lenses in here which solve problems for you. The students have to make uh, math tests and the least, uh, with the least, the ones with the least score would get executed. That's why the name, The Thinning. Uh, still a fun movie with a surprising uh, ending. We can uh, look at the past and uh, extrapolate. Moore has predicted that the number of trans transistors on a chip doubles every two years, and this law has continued to hold. Uh, also, hard drive storage has grown exponentially. I just got last week. I got a five terabyte drive for backup for 140 bucks. Uh, you can already buy 10 terabyte desktop drives. Uh, but it's difficult to predict, predict the future. The web uh, has grown exponentially, but it was not predicted by futurologists. Uh, uh, in the 900 years ago, uh, one has predicted this future to look different. Here is one picture. Uh, from the Washington Post, kind of illustrations, which are serious uh, predictions or this. Ray Kurzweil is one of these uh, computer futurologists who have warned about the singularity. Uh, he predicted that uh, computers, once predicted that computers will pass the Turing test till 2020 or that in 2090 the human brain has been reversed, engineered. But it might all come different. Are there fundamental limitations of computing? The most uh, important open problem in computer science is the PNP problem. It's one of the millennium problems. Uh, are NP problems the same than uh, P problems? So P problems are decision problems that are solvable in polynomial time. And uh, uh, NP problems are decision problems that can be verified in polynomial time if a solution is, is given. Uh, so here are some uh, 
uh, example. So that the P, if, if P is really strictly contained in NP, what most people think happens, then there are some problems which are really hard, like factorization of three coloring of a graph. That's a, these are problems which are believed to be hard. And then there are problems, NP complete problems, which if you can solve one of them, all of them uh, are so, so, so solved fast, and, also, and all of them can be solved fast. And there are also hard problems, uh, uh, NP hard problems, that's the halting problem. We will talk about this briefly. Here's an example of a concrete problem, which is in NP. The problem is to decide whether two graphs are isomorphic. The harder problem is to decide whether a given graph is a subgraph of a given second graph, and this is even NP complete. This means if one could solve this effectively, and one could solve all NP problems effectively and prove that P is equal to NP. Here's another problem which is NP complete. It's the integer partition problem. The group of integers, the number of integers, the question is find the, the best uh, division into two groups to make the, the sum of both as close as possible. Also, integer factorization is something which is in NP. You can verify very quickly if you know the factors, but it's hard to find, or believed to be hard to find. Uh, sometimes it's easy, like if you have 18 digits of 1, <laughs> you know, of course you know that it's divisible by 9, but in general it's, a hard, it's hard to uh, decide, uh, 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 find the factors. Uh, Turing had another great idea. He formalizes precisely what a computer is and allows to have computers even as input of other computers. We cannot get much into it, but the concept is called a Turing machine. And the halting problem is uh, the question, is there a Turing machine which can, which can decide whether a given machine halts or not? And the answer is no. So Turing proved this with an argument similar than the counter diagonal argument. So he assumes that such a machine exists and then looks what happens if you, uh, you build a machine uh, uh, halt, which uh, if you feed it, you get the contradiction. So there are limits of computing, like there are limits uh, for axiomatic mathematics uh, uh, established by Gödel. And to the very end, we look at artificial intelligence. It's a hot topic now. It's used to solve problems, to uh, do research, data mining, creativity simulation. Uh, prediction. Uh, there had been a big hype in the 60s, but then there was a, a, a winter, AI winter, and the, the, but the interest has returned back in 97, uh, and in the 90s, and uh, 2000. So since then, a lot of uh, companies are actually AI companies. Maybe the movie uh, AI of Spielberg of also helped to, to promote the subject a little bit. How long will it take until computers can do research or solve puzzles or verify uh, things? So in this case, we have actually we have a riddle. It's a well-known riddle uh, uh, where uh, there's a missing square. You can rearrange this, and there's a missing square here. And uh, a computer uh, who who needs to find this has to be a creative. And uh, here's another example. So how could an artificial intelligence find? A problem in the following argument. I sh just show you that all triangles are equilateral. Start with an angle bisector and an orthogonal side bisector and mark the intersection. Then connect this perpendicularly to the sides and the other points. The two triangle, red triangles are congruent as they have the same angles. They have the angle, angle bisector and one common side. And a right angle also. So they are they are congruent. The bottom purple triangles are also congruent. So they have a right angle and two sides are equal. So Pythagoras, for example, the hypotenuse has the same length. Now we can conclude that the yellow triangles are, or the green now triangles are congruent. Uh, but now we see that the left and right side is equal because they are made up of, of equal pieces. So that's the proof that the, these sides are equal. Then you can repeat the argument with the other sides to show that they're all equal. I learned this more than 30 years ago from a computer scientist. Uh, but, you know, these computer scientists are interested in this because, for example, a computer should be able to verify a proof, a proof that it's, it's a correct proof. And actually, I was not lying to you uh, here in, in that proof. So how can a computer find a mistake in this argumentation? 
Well, this is the end uh, of this lecture and the end of the course.